This video will review every tidbit about the infestation that I could possibly find within a humane amount of time. A story about a virus with the potential to conquer the universe. Let's begin. You know about the infestation, right? Spreads like a month old salad with genocidal intent. Swallows everything it touches, making monsters from meat or metal or both. Well, these days it's mostly contained. Spores as old as stone, derelicts drifting in forgotten orbits. So it was with old Kanga, somehow exposed and promptly cast out. Woke up on a blessed cage drop down to Eris. Normally victims to our chaotic killing spree, infested our faction with some of the most underwhelming enemies. Although that is counteracted by some of the most overwhelming enemies. The sheer diversity and tenacity of this virus is one to behold. One that many of us can't seem to fully grasp. Even our greatest weapons stem from a mere virus. A microscopic organism that has found a way to enfeeble entire civilizations. But let's delve deeper into that. So that the next time you destroy one of these amalgamations of flesh and metal, you understand them a bit more. Where do they come from? What is their directive? All these questions answered and more. Now rewind. Before. Before even the old war. Back to the Orican era. After experimenting with biology and technology to create a virus that can be used in warfare, the Orican made a fatal mistake, one that would cost the system an innumerable amount of lives. The Technocyte virus had the ability to turn whatever it touched into sustenance, as well as a being with the sole purpose of spreading. But it still being a virus, basic virology would still apply, right? So why doesn't quarantining and vaccination work against the technocyte virus? The strategies that humans of today apply to much smaller threats. Well, this virus doesn't abide by the laws of a basic virus. It acts as a fungus as well as a virus creating violent nanospores that actively seek out new hosts. So to give a perspective on the gravity of the situation, if the humans of today dealt with the technocyte virus, we'd be extinct. But surely the idea of quarantining anything in the far reaches of space should work. And to be honest, it did. Not. Being biomechanical allowed it to last forever. It could lie dormant for a millennia turning even inorganic material into sustenance. So what is the process of becoming infected? Tumors. Boils. Masses of infected flesh upon whatever unfortunate enough to be contaminated. Cure? Removal. Removing any part of the victim that is infested would work sometimes. After the infested host loses their mind, their bodies transform, turning flesh to metal, even fusing armor to flesh. The metal that we are often dealing with is ferrite, ferrite being the equivalent of steel. Immediately the development of new organs begins, the neurode being the primary decision making and communication organ. Communicating with what, you may ask? The hive mind. The hive mind being the entity that guides all infested. Trachons found on ships and in established infested biomes facilitate communication from the neurodes of infested lifeforms. These lifeforms are nearly unidentifiable with their original counterparts. For example, a Grenier Lancer is a basic unit but clearly looks nothing like an infested charger. This kind of transformation is not far off from the parasitic organisms we are used to though. The famous fungus called Cordyceps does something similar to its hosts, turning them into entities with the sole purpose of spreading. The reason I want to stress the significance of this comparison is because the Technocyte virus uses the same tactics as fungi. The use of spores is one thing, but even mimicking the fruiting body is undeniable. Here's some mycology for you. Here you would have what is called a sporangiophore. Sporangiophores are the stalk that produce the sporangium, the flower of the organism if you will. This is the part that produces the vicious nanospores. The best way to get rid of these creatures seemed to be fire, but the adaptability of it eventually made it useless, and the intelligence of the infested seemed to be negligible until an organism like Lephantis came into existence. We spoke about what victims of the infested turn into, now 
What happens if we extend the period of time in which they are infested? You get something that is entirely different. In the case of Lephantis, a being that is capable of speech, only telepathically and only very basic speech. But of course, the Warframes can hear it loud and clear. Recording. The codices within reveal the hidden weakness of your most feared enemy. My creations, my frames of war. What led us here? You did, you vile blasphemies. Machines thinking, breeding. You were to bear us a new promised land. But when you arrived at that distant world, you knew that in time, we would bring ruin to it as well, as we had to Earth. And so it was, we came to war. Our hubris shone like a black star. For our technology, our war machines were your kin. How easily you turned them against us. We were forced to older means. Not circuits, nor light, but flesh and disease. The Helminth Strain Created by Ballas and cultivated by the Orokin to create the strongest warriors we now love. Sometimes. To be quite honest with all of you, I could prove my theory of the Infested being the strongest faction off of this strain alone. Pyro, Cryo, and Psychokinesis, Black Hole Creation and Matter Manipulation, Antimatter Manipulation, Pocket Dimensions, Time Travel, Immortality, ju just to name a few. But that'd be boring. Yes, Warframes are heavily augmented in order to have these abilities, but it doesn't even matter. It still stems from the virus. Ballas found a way to augment this virus to create solutions for unique situations it was exposed to. The reason I say situations is because some of these Warframes couldn't have been created without being exposed to complex simulations or augmentation. For example, think about how Limbo would have been created. Since we are all very familiar with this strain, I don't want to spend too much time on it. If you'd like to know more about the Helminth strain and the story of the Warframes, you can reference my video on the upper right corner of your screen and in the description. If we fast forward to when the Tenno awoke in a dystopian system, derelicts from the outbreak remain. These were abandoned ships completely overtaken by the infested, and they remained like that for an untold period of time. This strain is in fact the oldest, perhaps even the original strain of the infested. That being said, Lephantis was found in a derelict. The reason it was capable of speech must be due to its age. So theoretically, age to the infested should mean it is stronger or at least one of the strongest, but that's incorrect. The strength of the Technocyte virus is only measured by what it's been forced to adapt to. Meaning the derelict strain may be the weakest strain of Technocyte having been the first. This strain alone was still powerful enough to put the system into panic mode though. So you can imagine the power creep with the later strains. The biology of the derelict strain cannot be determined by the enemies found there as I don't think it is accurate. What I mean by this is based on the description of this enemy right here, the infested ancient. We know the transformation the infested undergo when left for a very long time. So why aren't all the infested in the derelicts ancients? The only explanation I could come up with is that the derelicts were raided for old Orokin tech, but even then that wouldn't make sense. Why? Because it would yield diminishing results. The infested destroy technology over time by consuming its materials. Why would anyone go to the extent of harvesting Orokin technology that wouldn't even be guaranteed to work? Maybe you guys could tell me if I'm wrong here, but I don't believe the Grenier and Corpus are that stupid. So based on the lore Warframe provided us, there should be a slew of ancients at different degrees, even mini versions of Lephantis. They should accentuate the fossilized flesh encrusted in dust and debris. They should be so old that they need to break in order to move. Heck, if you really want to make the derelicts the lore rich places they should be, why not go for bodies encrusted into the infestation all over the walls? Why not some infested that are able to talk to you at varying degrees? This is more critique than lore though, so I digress. If anyone at D is watching this, derelict rework, please. The Grey Strain is without a doubt the strain second to the Helminth Strain. 
It originates from Deimos, one of Mars' moons. But how exactly did the strain come into existence? During the Orican era, Deimos underwent terraforming just like the rest of the system, so it was full of flora and fauna. As the sentients began their siege during the Old War, two void engineers, Belric and Rania, sought to slow the sentients down on Deimos. So they gathered infested entities and created a biobomb, turning Deimos into the monster that it is today. The most interesting thing about Deimos is not that the Technosvirus adapted, it's how it adapted. The virus did not just consume all the flora and fauna, it changed the ecosystem. Now it's as if the animals here adapted to life alongside the infested. This of course is the only time we know of the infested somewhat cohabitating. The only other example is that of the Kavat, but they just eat infested and could care less about cohabitation. I believe the gray strain is second only to the helmet, reason being is mass scale symbiosis, a true symbiotic relationship between most of if not all hosts. Fish have adapted the ability to fly using an extra organ. Take this with a grain of salt as Deimos is truly hostile. The creatures are most certainly trying to shorten your lifespan, but they remain to be interesting. For example, the Nexafera resembles a predatory snail as they feed on cryptolix. There are predocytes which are dog-like predators, Volpophila which are cat-like predators. There are even infested themed fruiting plants. The fish have somewhat of a food chain if you look into it as well. Even two massive immortal worms that kill each other over and over to create a day and night cycle, Fass and Vohm. One of the diggers ran out of juice. We better see what we can find to power it up again. If we could see more of this world, I'm certain the diversity would explode. Now, the Mutalist strain is one that is technically new despite being shown very early in Warframe's lifespan. Alad V, out of obsession, he figured out what the Warframes are. Knowing that the Warframes stem from the Technocide virus, he figured out how to control a Warframe, as well as create his own strain, Mutalist. This strain would eventually overcome Alad V, making him go insane. The abilities of this strain was somewhat similar to the normal Technocide virus. Alad V only enhanced one aspect of it to its limit, this aspect being the control of robotics. Finally, instead of just basic robotics, the Technocyte virus could find its way into advanced technology, to the extent of controlling a Cephalon, which should be impossible. The reason being is that they exist in the Weave. What is the Weave? The Weave is a higher form of the internet capable of holding multiple consciousnesses. Bear with me for a moment. If we were to compare human brains to a computer, our brain could take up to 2.5 petabytes. What is a petabyte, you may ask? It is 1,000 terabytes, or in other words, 1 million gigabytes. The Weave is an internet-like system with probably millions of brains. For that, we can thank Quinn for making a bunch of them on the Zaram and 10 Zero videos in the description. As for the biology of the Mutalist strain, we have no info. The Jordis Golem showed us that the Mutalist strain was capable of controlling an entire ship and Cephalon, combining it into one singular being. But that can vary as the depth of understanding of the infested varies from situation to situation, as you will see from our last candidate, which kind of confuses me. <laughs> Y'all did see this coming, right, dreamers? Surely did, but not like this. A grand gathering before the emissary and his speaker. Standing room only. Bodies pressed to bodies. A great overheated mass breathing as one. Waiting for their beloved healer mute to speak. Kanga hushed the crowd. He shed his mask, and there he was, laughing at them. 
sick as the day he was banished. More. His retribution was at hand, born of a virus spreading further and faster than Spore and space ever could have. Arlo. And in that stunned silence, Arlo himself made a sound. Not a word, but a stifled gag. A swollen choke as he opened his mouth. And there it was, pointed, black, a tongue, but not, snaking and bulging and splitting him apart. I looked away then. I had to. But that sound stays with me. Not the sound of human terror, bad as it was. But what came after? The grinding wet, the rattling flutter, the congregation converted in the truest sense. I... Dreamers, you all got your work cut out for you. Though this movement has lost its head, the body still lingers. Arlo was a boy that survived being infested with magical healing powers. No, no he didn't. He was infested and healed people, quotation marks, by making them infested. This is third when it comes to our power scaling as the genius of the infested here is just undeniable. It was able to assess its predicament of finding hosts and solve it. This makes it the smartest infested aside from the mutilus strain. Reason being is that the Mutilus strain was good at controlling technology, not good at the application of it. This emissary strain leveraged interpersonal relationships as a way to gain new hosts or followers in this case. The reason this strain confuses me is also due to its intelligence. How is it able to be this smart? Is it due to Arlo still being somewhat conscious? And if that's the case, why doesn't the infested always do this? I could keep going, but you get the point here. I feel like the rest of the system has plot armor. The biology of this strain was a bit different, as every enemy was humanoid and equipped with different weapons. The Zeloid Prelate is equipped with a Pathocyst, which is an infested glaive. The Zeloid Bastion is a subordinate to the Prelate carrying Arlo's Flame for a boss mechanic. The Zeloid Proselytizer has an arm blade along with a gun. The Zeloid Herald had a gun that spewed toxic sludge. And the Zeloid Baptizer had dual arm blades. Now I know what you're thinking. What is up with these names? They actually have religious significance. First, let's take the word Zeloid and break it down. The suffix oid means to resemble or be like that thing. The thing in question here is a zealot or zealot, which means a person who is fanatical and uncompromising in pursuit of their religious, political, or other ideals. This matches up as Arlo was hailed as the emissary of Eris. Emissary meaning a person sent on a mission to represent another, the other being the infested. A prelate is a bishop or other high ecclesiastical dignitary, hence why he is the big bad in this story. Bastion, an institution, place, or person strongly defending or upholding particular principles, attitudes, or activities. The bastion protects the prelate in the fight, upholding certain principles, or in our case, just being annoying. Proselytizer, to induce someone to convert to one's faith or to recruit someone to join one's party, institution, or cause. Herald, official messenger, bringing news, or a person or thing viewed as a sign that something is about to happen. Baptize, admit someone into a specified church by baptism, or give a name or nickname to. First thing that sticks out to me is that obviously in this case, these words hold no religious sentiment. They aren't talking about Christianity here. But they do hold significance to the overall plot being a cult following. The scheme was of course hyper complex in comparison to what the infested normally does. So this strain alone would have begged the question of, 
how far can the infested go? What if the infested combined the best part of every strain leaving out the weaknesses? Theoretically, I believe it is possible as things like the Mutalist and Helmuth strain exist. This super strain, quotation marks, would have the intelligence of the Emissary, adaptability of the Helmuth, the diversity of Grey, robotics control of the Mutalist, and the longevity of the derelict strain. All of these attributes would allow interstellar communication as well as the magical powers of the Warframes. Imagine, chargers that could duplicate themselves and gain extra lives like Wukong, an ancient that could drag you into limbo for a one-on-one -on -one fight. Mutalist Ospreys that can anchor themselves in time to become virtually unkillable. Imagine that and more on the scale of millions. We don't even know if the Helminth can adapt to the Void yet, but if it can, maybe there will be murmur infested. Forget being the strongest virus, this strain could conquer the man in the wall. And before you say that the Helminth strain is the super strain, you are wrong. The Helminth has a very clear disadvantage, which is the ability to create working, intelligent, sentient Warframes. The Emissary Strain would take care of that. The rest would just allow the Infested to execute more complex actions toward their primary directive. Think of how beehives work. They have specialized bees for different tasks. Bees for rearing young, bees for gathering honey, etc. The one weakness that I've gathered from the Tenno is the lack of teamwork. What I mean by this is that the Tenno are equipped to perform covert operations alone or with a small team. The largest team we've seen is eight, and this does not happen often. This most likely is due to game structure. Even so, the only time a large group of Tenno gather to complete a task is very few and far between. The infestation has a swarm mentality, overwhelming enemies in order to win. Combine that with intelligent Warframe-like infested and you have a recipe for disaster. For my Warhammer fans. Tyranids. At the end of the day, the infested undoubtedly have the most potential out of any faction. Being the origin of the Warframes, we can tell that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The Technocide virus is capable of infinite evolution, but I wonder if a strain like the one I theorized would ever come into existence. Only time will tell. Though if DE decides to make a super infested faction, Name one of them evil, please. Having a story to follow is much easier than creating your own. The story of the infested is somewhat all over the place, so I had to grab what was important just to make sure the video was not too bloated. The information cut from this video was the Great Plague. There was too little information on what it was. Albrecht referred to 1999 as plague year, so I wanted to leave that for a future video. All the fish, creatures, and resources on Deimos, some were relevant but only served a purpose for theory which was not the focus of this video in particular. For example, knowing that the fish on Deimos released gas to levitate isn't something I believe most Warframe players care about. Lastly, a theory that the Orokin that made the Technocyte virus were humans experimenting in 1999. But I'll save that for another story. Go watch my Warframe playlist if you like this, subscribe and hit that bell icon for video notifications. My next video will be on Final Fantasy, so I hope to see you all in Midgar. Peace.